This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack, the professor for this class, and this is Lecture 44 on Lithography, Projection Imaging Part 2. Last time we talked about the role of the lens in capturing a portion of the diffraction pattern and using that diffraction pattern to form an image. This time we're going to actually work an example problem. We're going to pick as our example a mass pattern of equal lines and spaces. We define the pattern by talking about the pitch. The pitch of the pattern is the line width plus the space width and we'll assume that this pattern repeats forever. Now no real mass pattern repeats forever but if you have quite a few lines and spaces, maybe 10, um, there's not going to be any difference in the middle line and space in that array of 10 lines and spaces. Uh, there would be no difference in, uh, in those middle features as if I had an infinite number of them. So in this case, 10 is about equal to infinity. Uh, nonetheless, we'll talk about the pitch um, of an array of lines and spaces. Let's pick as our example 250 nanometers as the pitch. We'll assume we have equal lines and spaces so that the space width is 125 and the line width is 125 nanometers. The result is a diffraction pattern like this shown here, the zero order, the plus or minus first, plus or minus second, etc. Then this diffraction pattern of discrete points of light, discrete diffraction orders, will be transmitted through a lens. And the lens has a certain radius. The radius in spatial frequency terms is Na over lambda. So I'll pick a lens with an Na of 0 0.93. This is about the highest numerical aperture that we can get without going to immersion lithography. We'll talk about immersion lithography later. So this will be a non-immersion system, a dry system we say, with an Na of 0.93 and we'll have the wavelength be the lowest wavelength that we have available today in manufacturing uh, 193 nanometers. You probably recall that that wavelength is generated by an argon fluoride excimer laser. So, Na of 0.93, lambda of 193, I've got a pitch on the mask of 250 nanometers. Very quickly, let me say that I'm going to always reference the feature sizes to the dimensions on the wafer. Now the mask may be four times bigger, um, but I won't talk about the mass dimensions, I'll talk about the wafer dimensions. Why? Because uh, the wafer size is four times smaller, but the Na is four times bigger. Uh, you work the problem on either side, on the mass side or the wafer side, you come up with the same answer. You might try that as a check. What if you were to work the problem I'm about to describe on the mass side rather than the wafer side? You'll find out that you'll get the same answer. So let's work it on the wafer side. The pitch and the wafer side dimensions would be 250 nanometers. Now, how many diffraction orders go through the lens? Remember, every diffraction order occurs at a position of n over the pitch, where n is an integer. So the maximum value of n here, divided by the pitch, has to be less than or equal to the spatial frequency cutoff, which is Na over lambda. That's the radius of our lens. So we simply plug in the value of the numerical aperture, the value of the wavelength, the value of the pitch, and ask what is the biggest integer less than or equal to Na times the pitch divided by the wavelength. And the answer is 1. That is, the 0 and the plus and minus 1 orders make it through the lens and nothing else does. So this picture that I've drawn is uh, reasonably accurate. Okay, now we know what portion of the diffraction pattern goes through. Now what does the lens do? Uh, the lens is going to take the inverse Fourier transform. So let's take our general expression for the diffraction pattern. Uh, delta functions showing the positions in spatial frequency space of the diffracted orders, multiples of n over the pitch. The amplitude of every diffracted order a sub n is sine of n pi over 2 divided by n pi, where n is the diffraction order number. But instead of having an infinite number of diffraction orders, I only have three, the 0 plus and minus 1. So if I write out those terms explicitly, 
I put in n equal to 0 here, I get a sub 0 is simply 1 half. So there's my 0th order. I put in n equal to minus 1, sine of minus pi over 2 uh, is um, minus 1. Put in uh, minus 1 here, I simply get 1 over pi. So that's my minus first order, 1 over pi. Plug in n equal to plus 1 here, sine pi over 2 over pi, I get again 1 over pi, and so here's my plus first order. And that's it. Those are the only three orders that are present. Therefore, this is the diffraction pattern multiplied by the pupil function, which cuts out all the higher orders. Remember, our pupil function acts as a low-pass filter, filtering out all the high spatial frequencies, leaving only these three spatial frequencies in this case. Now, I simply have to take the inverse Fourier transform of this sum of three diffraction orders. So, how do I do that? Well, as I said, one of the advantages of Fourier transforms is we have a Fourier transform table. We can go look up the answers. And in the last set of lecture notes, I provided you with a table of Fourier transforms. And you see that there's a Fourier transform pair be between a delta function and 1. In other words, if I take the inverse Fourier transform of the delta function at a spatial frequency um, of 0, I get 1. Uh, in other words, uh, I get a plane wave. Um, delta function is a point of light. Uh, and when I take the Fourier transform, the inverse Fourier transform, I get a plane wave of unit amplitude normally incident on the wafer. Now, a point in the diffraction pattern produces a plane wave at the wafer. But what about diffraction? Uh, uh, delta functions that are shifted off of the origin. Right? Only the zero order delta function is at the origin. The other delta functions are at frequencies of plus and minus one of the pitch. In other words, they're shifted. That allows us to apply the shift theorem. That's a mistake on the slide. It's not the sift theorem. Uh, it's the shift theorem for um, uh, the Fourier transform, which is one of the uh, Fourier transform properties that we talked about last time. And in the homeworks, you'll have to prove uh, the shift theorem. I believe that's one of the homework problems. And here's the answer uh, from that list of, of theorems. The inverse Fourier transform of the delta function, delta function shifted by some frequency f prime becomes e to the i 2 pi f prime x. Well, if you don't recognize what that is, that is a plane wave. But it's not a plane wave normally incident on the wafer. It's a plane wave tilted and striking the wafer at an angle. The angle is given by f prime. Remember, f is sine theta over lambda. So the angle will be theta that it comes and intersects the wafer with, uh, angle relative to the normal. So we have now a tilted plane wave. If we apply uh, this inverse Fourier transform to all three, we see the zero order will produce a plane wave normally incident on the wafer. And then the two uh, shifted delta functions will produce plane waves that are coming at the wafer at angles. So I take the inverse Fourier transform. Uh, for the 1 half delta function, I simply get 1 half. Uh, for the 1 over pi, this delta function, I get 1 over pi times a plane wave traveling at an angle. Uh, here I get the opposite uh, negative angle. <clears throat> that is, I have three plane waves coming down to the wafer and interfering with each other. Now we can apply Euler's identity. You might recognize I've got an e to the plus i times a quantity. And added to e to the minus i times the quantity. And if you're up on your Euler's identities, that is nothing more than 2 times a cosine. So I replace those things with 2 times a cosine, and I have my answer now in a very simple form, 1 half plus 2 over pi cosine 2 pi x over p, where p is the pitch of the pattern. 
And sure enough, that results in an image with a period equal to the pitch on the mask, which is what I was hoping would happen. I would like an image on the wafer that looks like the mask pattern. The mask has a period of P. The image has a period of P. Let's look at this result graphically. I've got a mask up here with my lines and spaces of period P, an objective lens that has an entrance pupil and an exit pupil, and then a wafer where my image is going to be produced. I shine normally incident light on the mask. That's all we've talked about so far. Uh, we will talk about other ways of illuminating the mask soon. But I'll get three diffracted orders that make it through this particular lens. The zero order is in the middle here, the plus first order over here, and the minus first order over here. This light will be transformed by the lens to be light traveling away from the exit pupil to the wafer. By the time it reaches the wafer, these will be plane waves. A normally incident plane wave traveling straight down coming from the zero order. The plus first order will produce a plane wave traveling at an angle of theta. Uh, again, sine of theta will be 1 times uh, lambda over the pitch. Um, minus first order will produce the same angle but a negative angle. So I'll get a plane wave traveling at the opposite angle. Uh, these three plane waves interfering with each other resulting in a sinusoidal image. This sinusoidal image will have the same pitch, same period as the original mass pattern, and wherever I had a dark pattern on the mask, I'll get a dark region on the wafer. The bright regions in the mask will produce bright regions on the wafer. And the intensity on the wafer will be this electric field quantity squared. So we just derived last time the electric field was 1 half plus 2 over pi times cosine of 2 pi x over p. Now I take that quantity and square it, and this is the actual intensity of light that our photoresist will see projected onto it uh, because of the imaging of this particular mass pattern of lines and spaces with this particular lens. So we've worked out an imaging example. Um, we could work out an example for an isolated space, but the mathematics of the image become a little bit uglier. The nice thing about repeating patterns of lines and spaces is we get these discrete diffraction orders, and as we saw, the discrete diffraction orders produce simple integrals. Uh, delta functions produce very easy integrals, so it's very easy to answer our question, what does our uh, image look like? So we're going to stick to line space examples uh, because they're much easier mathematically. Well, that is a picture of one period of the line space patterns. When the maximum diffracted order going through the lens is n equal to 1. In other words, I get the 0 and the plus and minus first diffracted order through the lens. Well, you might ask yourself what would happen if I had a bigger lens that I could capture more diffracted orders. Well, if I make the lens bigger and I capture out to n equal to 3, this is what the image looks like. It's now blue squares instead of red circles, and uh, I have captured the 0, plus and minus 1, and plus and minus 3 diffracted orders. So the maximum order going through the lens is the third order. What if I had an even bigger lens? Well, I capture more diffracted orders, and if I could capture all the way out to the n equal to 9 diffracted order, I will get this image. Well, what's happening here? Each diffracted order contains information about the mass pattern. The more diffracted orders I capture, the more information is represented in the image. The image is an imperfect representation of the mass because I'm not capturing all the information from the diffraction pattern. I'm filtering out the high frequency information. But if I capture more diffracted orders, I have more information and I get a better image. Why is it better? 
Well, think about what the ideal image would look like. It would be zero underneath the chrome or the dark regions of the mask. It would jump up to one, 100% uh, transmittance in the uh, bright regions, and then drop back down to zero in the dark regions. Here I show what the mask pattern looks like up above, just to give me a visual clue as to what I should expect. Uh, the ideal image is a step function, uh, a step pulse. Um, uh, of an image. Which one looks most like that? Well, the n equal to 9 looks most like it. But maybe a better way to look at it is this. The whole goal in lithography is to figure out where to put the edge between the dark region and the bright region. And the more diffracted orders that I capture, the more information my image has about where to place the edge, where the edge, the transition from bright to dark exists. You can see that the, the red circles for n equal to 1 has a very gradual transition from bright to dark, but when I capture a lot of diffracted orders, I get a very sharp transition from bright to dark, indicating a much higher quality image. Alas, all lithography for state-of-the-art manufacturing results in images more like these red circles. We rarely capture more than the zero in the first diffracted orders. And life is uh, kind of hard for lithographers because of that. But we'll get more into that when we understand how the photoresist interacts with this image. In the meantime, let's review what we've learned about imaging so far. The numerical aperture defines the range of diffracted angles that can pass through the lens. In terms of spatial frequencies, that is, means there's a maximum spatial frequency, a cutoff. Uh, all spatial frequencies above Na over lambda are lost. Uh, all spatial frequencies between minus Na over lambda and plus Na over lambda pass through the lens. The imaging lens produces an image at the focal plane that is equal to the Fourier transform of that portion of the diffraction pattern which is actually captured by the lens. But because only a portion of the diffraction pattern is captured, all of the lost diffracted light results in an image that is degraded. It's not as good as the original. Uh, it's information that's been lost. So the more diffraction orders, diffraction orders we capture, the better the quality of the image. All right, what have we learned so far? Let's review, see if you can answer these questions. How can you determine which diffraction orders make it through the lens? Can you take the inverse Fourier transform of a sum of delta functions or diffraction orders? That's what we did in our example. You should be able to do that for other cases that also are the sum of delta functions or diffraction orders. A point of light or a diffraction order at the lens produces what type of wave or wave front at the wafer? And finally, what happens to the image if the lens captures more diffraction orders? Well, there's plenty more to learn about lithography. We'll have more to come. Till next time.